I wish, I wish I had time. I wish I had time to talk about two bars for 45 minutes, or for that. That maybe, maybe the 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 detail exhaustive is the best way to go. But my talk today is actually very broad, and I have very little time, so I'm going to plunge right in. Um, I think one of the most extraordinary things about Wagner's works um, is how little he imitates himself in general. Um, um, even the greatest composers find, I won't say a formula, but find something that works. Like Beethoven in the Fifth Symphony finds a certain kind of model that works structurally, dramatically, thematically, and he uses it many, many times. And there are various models he, he, he uses. And I think all composers and all writers, we all know mystery writers do that. I mean, they find, like Agatha Christie wrote basically three books, but, but 30 times each one. And, and, but, but if they do it successfully, there's no sense of repetition. It's not, Beethoven doesn't repeat himself, but he has a, but Wagner really doesn't do that. Every one of Wagner's, um, um, at least starting from the great ones, from, from, uh, from Fliegender Hollander on, is completely unique. and all has its own sound and its own premises and inhabits its own world. And that's a very unique feature. He, and, and when Wagner does quote himself in earlier operas, very, very seldom, for instance, the quotations from Tristan in Meistersinger, it really like slaps us in the face. Or it's so obvious, it's such an intrusion from a, a completely foreign world. And, and even when it's not a quotation, when it's simply intimations of others, at least to me, uh, the passages in, in the third act of Valkyra or in the second act of Siegfried, where it starts sounding like Tristan because he's thinking about Tristan, it also is extremely, uh, you really notice it. It makes you really sit up and pay attention. Now, Parsifal is, in some respects, the exception to this. Parsifal certainly does not sound like anything else. The French always talked about, there's this wonderful quotation that probably many of you know from Debussy, where he says that the score of Parsifal sounds as if it were lit from within. Um, it has, for, certainly its orchestration is very different from any of his other works. Part of that is because he had he constructed Bayreuth. He was writing it for Bayreuth. Bayreuth has a very, very special, unusual acoustic, and, and, and Wagner completely re- uh, formulates his way of writing for orchestra to suit this new hall, and perhaps to suit his subject, too. Um, and certainly, there's a great deal of material in Parsifal, which absolutely sounds unique to Parsifal. However, Parsifal is completely different from any of his other works in that Wagner does revisit, sometimes almost literally, sometimes um, near... Uh, close cousins, let's say, and sometimes more figuratively, more parallels with many things he has done before. And so that's sort of the, the reason for the topic I gave to my work, because this could be seen, if you look at it from a negative standpoint, you could say that Parsifal is in some ways a pastiche of Wagner's earlier works. That Wagner, as probably most of you know, when Wagner finished The Ring, he had decided he would write no more music dramas. He was going to dedicate himself to absolute music. And for various reasons, Cosima um, and Ludwig, and I think for a lot of reasons, convinced him to write something which he had dreamed about writing since 1845, Parsifal. Um, Parsifal has also a unique history in Wagner's life in that he worked on it seriously for such a long time. It's first in 1845, at the period when he wrote Tannhäuser, and then uh, when he was beginning to work on Lohengrin, then very intensely in the 1850s when he was writing uh, a Tristan, um, so much so that he gets confused between, he has the idea that Tristan is going to be visited in Act 3 by the wandering Amfortis, I mean, to this extent. And then in 1865, he, when he writes the prose sketch of Parsifal, and let's not forget that Wagner himself said that any time he wrote a prose sketch, any time he wrote, uh, he always had a, what he called eine musikalische Duft. The, the, the always, even if he wasn't writing down material, he had a musical uh, aroma. To it. So we have to assume that there are musical ideas from Parsifal globing all of this period. And so from this standpoint, I think Parsifal is very much the work of someone looking back on all of his earlier works and completing it and having a sort of completion. So in, in my uh, talk today, I'm going to go over some of the uh, ways in which he uses his earlier works and in which both enrich Parsifal and I think also leave... Um, well, just leave 
I won't say problematic, but leave challenges within the listening of Parsifal. One way in which Parsifal is different from all the other Wagner works is that the music, so much of the music sounds so radically different from each other. You know, in The Ring, for instance, the music of The Ring, the, they oppose each other. For instance, the, the, the ring motifs world, and, uh, which is all dark and dissonant, is very different from the, the, the sword motives world, which is very clear and, 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 and uh, well, I hate to use musical terms, diatonic, it's very, it's very solid. But Wagner opposes these worlds, they very much are in relation to each other all the time. Whereas in Parsifal, these worlds exist as if in completely uh, uh, parallel universes with almost no point of contact. The worlds, especially the world of Klingsor and Kundri, which is also the world of Amfortis. They all have pretty much the same music, which is in itself a remarkable thing. And the world of the Knights of the Grail, on the other hand, these, and this to some extent also reflects the periods in Wagner's life that he uses or develops the material from. So I'm going to start right off with the, the work that I think is the most easily associated with Parsifal, although not the work I think that Parsifal is closest to, and that would be Lohengrin. And the reason, of course, it's the easiest associated is it's, it's about a night, a night of the Grail. I mean, theoretically, it's about Parsifal's son, um, a Lohengrin. And, and I wanted to start with um, the most clear-cut reference um, to another work in Parsifal, which is the Swan. Because in, 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 in Lohengrin, the Swan's music is... Farewell, my lily. And then in Parsifal we have. Exactly the, the 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 same music identically, and but a much more profound um, loan from Lohengrin is you know the very basic idea in Lohengrin the very beginning. This, which we also heard as as the swan, it's just it's just a little condensation of that idea. Is the idea also behind? same chords, the, the Dresden Amen. It belongs to the same world. And Wagner's first sketches of the Dresden Amen go all the way back to 1845, when Wagner was, of course, living in Dresden. So it's an, um, there's, there's uh, a very close tie with that. Let's look at one other place in, uh, um, in Lohengrin. Let's, well, take a more a, tri a trickier place in Lohengrin. Um, one of the most, more unusual motifs in Parsifal, um, unusual insofar as that we think that it's, it's from Wagner in the late 1870s, one of the characteristics of Wagner's music, especially from The Ring On, Tristan On, is that the themes are very what he calls plastic. And by plastic he means you can do lots of stuff with them. They're, they, they, they're, they're very flexible. And for that reason, they're usually very elemental because if you have to take something down to its atomic structure, you can do the most um, So that's one of the reasons why Wagner in his later works has fewer and fewer like really long line melodies. And when he does they, something like Wintersturm in, in, in Valkyra, it kind of sticks out on purpose, I would say in that case, from the rest of the uh, environment. So in Parsifal we have... which is the motive we first hear when Parsifal comes on stage. And this is Parsifal's motive. Um, and uh, it's always the same. I mean, well, okay. When he, it does get that modification when he comes on stage in Act 3 with his, um, uh, the, covered with armor. And, and no, they don't know who he is, but the orchestra tells us, of course. But that's just Wagner. But, um, and then when he's in glory, it's some... Um, sort of 
slowed down and made very pompous and grand. But um, this is not the kind of music that we associate um, with Wagner. At the, I mean, it's, it's very unusual for this, this because it's so sort of... Um, I, I, I'm, I, I want to look for a word. I mean, it's wonderful, but it's kind of one-dimensional in a way. It's very sort of the hero kind of feeling uh, in, in a way that we don't associate with sort of mature Wagner writing or we don't associate with the rest of Parsifal especially. It's, I think, comes very definitely from... Which is, of course, from Lohengrin, the Lohengrin's theme. It's, it's not that... I can't musicologically show you exactly how they're the same, but they belong, they're cut from the same cloth. Since Lohengrin is Parsifal's son, although of course in reverse in a way, you could say that the, the fruit has not fallen from very far from the tree. Um, and and I'm, in a way, the, what I'm here, uh, and, and I'm going to do it again, so I, I wanted to um, very carefully guard myself from sounding like that I'm criticizing Parsifal, which of course is one of the great towering masterpieces of, 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 of humanity, um, that it has these sources which are very, very different within it. Um, and this is, yes, it's a challenge in a way, but it's also part of what it is. If Wagner in, in Parsifal is looking back over his whole life and looking to make a completion of this whole life, you could argue that he wants purposely to go back. And it's not an accident, by the way, that all of his works are very heavily present in Parsifal, except for Fligander Hollander. But Fligander Hollander is something that for some reason Wagner had pretty much dismissed. He had never planned to have Fligander Hollander done in um, Bayreuth. And he actually, as far as I know, never, he did that one revision of Fligander Hollander in the 1860s, but he kind of stayed away from Fligander Hollander, um, whereas uh, Tannhäuser, he was um, very involved with, and of course Lohengrin was one of Wagner's greatest successes. I think um, moving from Lohengrin, we'll go to the work where I think Wagner really um, uh, gets quite a lot of the material for the ring, or quite a lot of the idea of the ring. Perhaps, strangely enough, more than Lohengrin, um, which is Tannhäuser. I, um, let me play a passage from the ring, from the ring, from Parsifal, sort of a ring, which I think is something which, when we hear it, sounds extremely, it's, not just um, great, but really different. I mean, it sounds like something we don't expect to hear with these enormous pregnant silences and, and the sort of the bare bones of it. with the
This, of course, is from the middle section of the, um, thank you, the middle section of the, of the, the prelude. And we'll get a, an almost complete and even actually prolonged reprise of this um, in the grail scene at, at, towards the end of the, of, of the act. Um, now, the source of this music, or in a way, I, source is too strong a word, the, the, maybe the reference point of this music comes from Tannhäuser, the third act, and the music that has to do with um, the pilgrims coming, f f um, to, going to and then coming from um, um, Rome. I mean, right away at the beginning of the act, the act three. We already have an atmosphere that sounds a lot like Parsifal. And then the sun. But I want to move a little bit further on, so let's go from here. This is like the silence we had. silence. I, I was using the word silence, but what I meant really is like a pause. In, in, in Parsifal, it really is silence. Um, at this stage, I think he's afraid to have silence. So he does, you know, this sort of rumbling sound to build to the next one. And these strong unisons, this kind of absolute iron, strong sense of, of faith, I mean, it's usually, um, um, is, is, I think, very close to what we hear in the Parsifal. Now, there are some things in the Parsifal which are completely absent in the, um, uh, in the music from Tannhäuser. For instance, in the parts of all, when he goes. All these, these voices following on each other. It has this polyphonic richness. Polyphonic just means there's more than one voice. So wh where does that come from? He didn't have that when he wrote uh, um, um, uh, um, Tannhäuser. Well, it actually comes from music like. Everybody tell me what that is, please? Meisterzinger. Yes. When Wagner, Wagner took five years to write Meisterzinger, um, uh, uh, longer than any other single opera. And uh, one of the reasons he had, he was struggling so hard with, with immersing himself in good old traditional German counterpoint, medieval counterpoint. And of course the score of Meisterzinger is just absolutely full of it. But, and he's learned his lesson. He uses it wonderfully in Parsifal. He takes this material, this raw, strong, the faith material with this brass and, and octaves, but now he's also he's added rhythmic complexities, which he would never have dreamed of in, 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 in Lohengrin, and added this wonderful polyphonic richness, um, which you know, I think is, is definitely a, a sort of a process in, 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 in going. Another passage in, um, there's a lot of passages that remind me very much of, of um, at the end of the Pilgrim's Chorus, and not the original Pilgrim's Chorus, but the one in Act Three, when they come back, and and Tannhäuser is not with them, and Elizabeth is in despair, um, we have the you know the the, the the we hear that we hear the whole thing again, the famous one, and then they cry Hallelujah.
which I think is very close to. Yeah. That's probably the closest, the closest single moment. There are other places that remind me very much of Tannhäuser. I'm going to put the score up. There's no room. Um, the choruses of the nights after the, gale, the grail scene, which I will now find, um, also have a, a sound that remind me very much of the, the, the returning pilgrims, especially, um, let me get going. This is not going to be easy because of the page turns. This is the Playing it like this takes it out of character. You have to actually hear it in the pomp and circumstance. But the, the, the character of the melody is very, very close to the character, and the character of the atmosphere of the returning pilgrims. And I think it's not, Wagner first conceived of Parsifal in 1845, the year he wrote Tannhäuser. So it's not stretching anybody's imagination to imagine that his ideas of the, 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 the Knights of the Grail singing and the, the, uh, the pilgrims to, for, coming to and going to, uh, from Rome, which is the, sort of the background of the whole story of Tannhäuser, would run concurrently in his mind. And so you could say it's a sublimation of this idea or a, or a coronation of this idea that starts in Tannhäuser that comes into um, uh, Parsifal. Okay, now I'm going to move to the much more substantial influences. Um, I think that the... The work that most obviously um, inspired a great deal or is related strongly to a great deal of Parsifal is Tristan. And um, it's especially the Tristan of Act Three of the Suffering Tristan. Um, the, the, the Tristan of... Or something like... All these, this very... Um, if I could start playing, I'll never stop, so I'd soon not start. I, I very carefully didn't bring my score of Tristan, so I wouldn't start. Um, but but um, this, this extremely dissonant, one of the things that Wagner really discovers, does everybody know what a dissonance is? Dissonance is when there's a musical sense of, 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 of unrest, of, of, of tension. And the, the music was revolved, revolved around the idea of you create tension and you resolve it. But in Tristan, and I, I know I talked about this to some extent when I did my lecture here on Tristan. Tristan, Wagner creates a whole new musical language where one state of tension, one dissonance, doesn't resolve but goes to another state of tension or goes yet to another state of tension. That, and that the resolution, if it comes at all, almost comes extremely delayed. And, and um, all of the music associated with Kundry but also with Amfortis and also with, with Klingzor, all the, um, let me find... A good juicy one. That's the ring. Oh, there's so many. I have too many examples. I mean, you can't get more dissonant than that. I mean. And no, no resolution in sight. As a matter of fact, um, to me, one of the most absolutely miraculous um, passages in the history of music is finally when Act Two of Parsifal has its resolution. The final cadence in Act Two of Parsifal is, is one of the miracles of the ages. Um, you know, after this entire act based on... on All, all that, that basic motivic world around Kundry. At the very end of the act, we have this. Any 
resolves it. That's, that's, let me play that with just the, just the chords. That's the very, very end of Act Two of, of uh, he has his famous line, "You know where you can find me again," and 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 goes off. Um, so, in, so in a way, the, the presence of, of Tristan is is sort of everywhere, and in, in, in especially in Act Two. But there are other little subtle things which are also um, one of the things that Wagner does in in this motive. Is, is the, probably the most suffering and, and uh, dissonant of all of Tristan's music. But in the middle of the love duet, he transforms it where he... He sort of by magic turns it into something where it starts off with this great dissonance. And it becomes luscious and, and full of promise, full of sensuality. Um, and and um, this is far too good of an idea for, for Wagner not to want to use again. And he does. <laughs> and he does. He uses it over and over again, actually, in the scene with, in the, in the Flower Maiden scene. Most of the Flower Maiden scene actually derives from something else, which I'll get to in a minute. But... Um, The problem with Wagner is he has so many examples, you have to find the, rest, the best one. That's not it yet, excuse me. Okay, here we go. It's the same idea exactly, right? The, the one in Tristan is... And here it's... Do it again. This is the sort of modulations in Wagner that always, to me, have the effect as if um, the ground is being pulled from out from underneath you. You know, you're 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 in in one world. This. sort of sinks down into another one. And so um, he uses this a great deal in, in, uh, in, in the second act of Parsifal. But probably, I mean, it would make sense that the work that I think has the strongest sort of structural relationship to Parsifal is The Ring. After all, The Ring is the work that he was working on um, not only right before he actually wrote Parsifal, the, the, the final version, but in 1865, he was going to be coming back to Parsifal. It was sort of right when he was still working on Meistersinger, when he was working on Tristan, and he had the idea of, 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 uh, of, of Amfortis visiting Tristan. He was in the middle of writing The Ring. So The Ring is sort of omnipresent. And actually, even if we go to, the, to starting sort of at the end, if we go to this scene itself with the um, uh, flower mains, this... To me, it's a very close cousin to the world of So you have And so um, 
it's as if the flower maidens are a revisiting of the sort of never never land world of the of, of the Rhine maidens. Of course, and it puts I think an interesting light on the flower maidens. One of the things that's so fascinating about all of these things is is that they can enrich and deepen our understanding of the subjects because they help show us Wagner's concept of them. Music doesn't lie. Um, um, people, composers can get in their own ways when they start writing words, even when they start writing texts. But the music always comes, if it's great music, it comes from the heart. And the fact that Wagner relates the Rhine Maidens of Act Three of Gunther Demmerung, um, who are, who are you know, sirens and silly and sensuous, but it also have a certain wisdom and perhaps even a certain a tragedy to, the, to the, the flower maidens in Act Two of Parsifal is perhaps very significant. I mean, um, and and, and um, it's, it's worth remembering, speaking of the flower maidens, that Parsifal, just upon having um, baptized um, Kundri, saving Kundri, and Kundri is finally weeping. Of course, this is the symbol that, that she is indeed saved because she, could, she says, you know, ever since she laughed at Christ in some other uh, incarnation, she can only laugh, she can never weep, and now finally she's weeping. Um, and he says, I wonder if those girls were also longing for salvation. And, he's, and, and the music is a hint of the, of the flower maidens. So there's perhaps more to the flower maidens than just, um, you know, sort of evil seductresses or, or um, it's probably also worth noticing that Wagner's last sort of um, amourette sort of love affair was with Pringle, who was one of the flower maidens at the 1882 uh, production. That's that's just an aside. That don't take that. Don't that that one isn't isn't to be taken seriously. Oh my God, time flies. Um, let's let's um, move on to some other things, in the, and then I want to get to one or two more substantial things. There is a very unusual sounding motif in Parsifal, which we hear first in Gurdamans's monologue, and then we hear at other times when. Um, miracles happen. And there's a whole kind of, of, of harmonic world of miracles. This particular motif is... Very, very strange chords. Very, I mean, you don't it's one after the other that are unexpected sounding chords. And uh, and in this kind of chord chordal progression infects other music. For instance, at the absolute climax, at the end of the opera, when Kundry is, is radiantly dies, the, it, instead of going, it goes. Does the same kind of this, this sort of okay? Well, in these same strange chords, anybody tell me where this comes from? Well, right, the first time in Valkyra when he's putting her to sleep, we hear it, of course, over and over in the ring. It, it has to do with sort of a magical world, and actually. Um, the, 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 I, I had intended to, but I'm going to run out of time. Parsifal is full of, of sort of a, what you call sublimations of Tarnhelm music of, of, in, in the world of magic, where the magic is, is and, and one I can't resist, even though I don't have time, um, is, is from, sorry. <laughs> um, this one is, is an example of how the same kind of magic harmonies can be used in very evil music. This is one of my favorite places in Parsifal, actually. Um, Stop there. Um, anybody know where this is? Yeah, a, a Klingzor is calling Kundry up. He says, Dein Meister ruft herauf. And we hear that. He blows that straight. 
that funny horn, and we hear these amazing chords. Of course, first thing, it sounds like the, the, the Norn scene, almost exactly, but it has that same kind of magical effect. Okay, I'm going to jump right now to sort of my last big point. I think um, there's, a, relating the ring music and Parsifal music is a very rich and possible subject. But one of the things that um, I think that most people would agree that nothing in Parsifal is greater, and maybe nothing is as great even, as the two transformation scenes, one in Act One, one in Act Three, when um, Wagner moves us, we, had, we just had a nice talk on that actually, he moves us out of space and time, he moves us from one place to another place, and he does so using some kind of a, what we call a music in ostinato, which just means something that goes on and on and on and on. And so what that does, of course, is it gives us something, a, a, con, a continuum upon which to show the effect of change. And, um, and in Parsifal, of course, he does it in, first in the, in the first act, uh, going to the celebration of the, of the Grail, and then, of course, in the third act, going from the, the coronation of, of Parsifal and the, and the Good Friday spell, which, by the way, is, comes directly out of the, the forest murmurs music. Um, that's for another lecture. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, the, the source of this, and I think really the source of a lot of the greatest sort of um, uh, dynamic music in Wagner, by dynamic, I mean music in change, is um, from the, the Sentin in Nibelheim, um, in Das Rheingold. A little bit also in the great prelude of the third act of, of, of Siegfried. You know, the, the, the St. Nibelheim, which starts... Um, that works. I'm start later. Nothing left to play for a while, um, except the, the beating of the anvils. And of course, it, the rhythm is related to the rhythm of, but it sort of changes over. And as we go through this thing, oh, an enormous amount is going on in this, this short passage of music, although I cut it. But, um, um, and this idea of taking this, this constant rhythm and, and, and turning it into something different is done in both of the great uh, transformation scenes. Um, the first transformation scene is really too long to play. Um, but the, the, the constant rhythm is introduced right away. Here's the magical interval, by the way. And here it is again. And on. Um, and of course, it builds. Like, it's hard not to play this. It's, it's the greatest music in parts of all. Um, but he builds this enormous um, um, on this. When the, the, the bells have disappeared, this next part is even great. We get it back. Anyway, um, and the bells completely take over the music. The, and with the, the actual bells come in, and it becomes, it leads to this great. Uh, great climax. But let's, I'd like to look, this one I actually do have time to play completely, the, um, although it's less pianistic really, the, the, the second transformation scene, the transformation um, 
going back at the, at the end. And of course, it's very mournful, which is kind of surprising. It's one of the most surprising things in Parsifal is, is that after you know, Parsifal's return and he brings the, the, the spear back and, and Gornemans' life is, is, is come to fruition. I mean, he's, he's one of the great moving scenes. He's so joyful. And then the, the, the redemption of nature, as it seems, is, or nature doesn't need redemption, it sort of is redemption, redeeming in the, in the Good Friday spell and the, 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 in the, the crowning of Parsifal, the, the baptism of Kundry. Um, then all of a sudden the music t- turns to tragedy, returns to the tragedy, of course, of, of the death of Titerel and, and uh, especially the sufferings of Amfortas. And it starts with this, this, a, a different rhythm, but this, again, this bam, 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 this pr- permanent rhythm. to stop for one second, horrible as it is, even though the music is utterly harmonically different from the, the bells are the same, same bells. It's now you just impose them on this incredibly different harmony. there. I mean, it's, it goes on for quite a while. But that, that, with that constant rhythm and then bringing the bells in, the sense of this journey, is this, this using of the musical um, interlude, the musical transition, as it were, to take us not just from one place to another place, from you know, the, 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 the cliff where the gods have their meeting down to Nibelheim, and in this case, from um, Gordomans' hut in the forest um, to the, the, the temple again now in ruins. Um, but the, using this as this musical transition which takes us with this continuum at the same time taking this in this extraordinary voyage of, of discovery and of expression. Thank you very much.